Hi everyone, welcome to our 22nd webinar uh, in the ConnectedLearning.tv series. I'm Mimi Ito and I'm uh, the Research Director of the Digital Media and Learning uh, Research Hub at the University of California, Irvine, and we've been hosting this series. Uh, today we're really delighted to have Connie Yowell joining us. Connie um, is one of my favorite collaborators and is also Director of Education uh, at the MacArthur Foundation and she'll be talking about reimagining the experience of education and the relationship to connected learning. Uh, for those of you watching on live stream, uh, we welcome you to participate on the chat, introduce yourself, um, of course, talk, share resources, and also uh, we encourage you to ask questions on the chat in the live stream and we'll do our very best to try to collect those questions from the chat and address as many as we can during the course of our one-hour webinar. Uh, I also wanted to note that we do have a Google Doc uh, that we use during our sessions uh, that can be used to collect group notes uh, uh, about the topic that we're covering today. So we really welcome your help in capturing uh, highlights, sharing resources throughout the webinar. So before I turn it over to Connie, I wanted to give um, the folks who are joining us on the uh, webinar today an opportunity to introduce themselves uh, and talk about, um, you know, if they like a little bit of their connection to the connected learning work. So, uh, Doug, you want to start? Yes, I'm, um, I'm Doug Belshaw. I'm Budget and Skills Lead uh, for Mozilla. And um, I'm also a co-kickstarter of a project called Purposed, which um, that's purposed.org.uk. Um, and the aim of that is to get some kind of debate going, going around what the purpose of education is or purposes of education. Um, we've had lots and lots of interesting responses. We've um, encouraged people to have 500 words, um, various images, lots of mashups. People basically doing, um, in a very kind of small way, what Connie's doing here, trying to reimagine what the future of education might look like. Fantastic. Thanks, Doug. And it looks like uh, Marsha is still uh, getting her setup uh, worked out. So what I'll do is I'll introduce Marsha and I'll have her join in once she's able. Uh, so we also have us joining um, Joining us on the Hangout is Marsha Semmel, who is Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And Marsha um, and IMLS have just been a fantastic partner uh, with a lot of the connected learning and DML work that we've been engaged in, um, in part supporting uh, the uh, development of a new network of learning labs um, in partnership with the MacArthur Foundation um, and based on a lot of the models that have been emerging out of um, you media and some of the research that we've been involved in uh, in looking at how we can um, bring more uh, and more and more diverse kinds of learning institutions into the sort of work that we're doing. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Connie to uh, kick us all off and start the conversation. Uh, thank you, Mimi. I really appreciate that. And thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Uh, what I thought I'd do is I thought I would start very simply this morning uh, and sort of adhere to the, the goal of speaking for six minutes uh, and then uh, jump us into uh, what I hope is a, a lively conversation, both with the folks here but also hopefully with, uh, with the chats. And I'm, I'm also hoping just to, to let you know, John, uh, that Brother Mike would like to join too. So if you could give him an email, he might be a, a, another person who will join us uh, right here in the Google Hangout. Um, so what I want to do is to just give a little bit of a, a, a I'll work on the screen share. I want to start with the PowerPoint. Um, let's see if I can do this right, guys, and bring some slides up. Let me know the wrong. I want to start at the beginning. Let me know if you if those are up and folks can see those. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so I, what I wanted to do today was just to start uh, with a little bit of background uh, and, uh, and then to just very quickly give a little bit of background on why MacArthur uh, is invested in what we're calling uh, with the help of a whole lot of extraordinary people connected learning. And I thought what might be uh, perhaps of a, of a little bit of help is also just to tie our, our understanding of connected learning also back to uh, many of the connected learning 
uh, webinars that have been going on, which I think have just been extraordinary. And I want to thank both John Barillon and Jeff Brazil for putting this together because I think it's just extraordinary. So very quickly, let me let me just give a, a high level overview so folks have context and give a little bit of a history about how we all got here, um, in the hopes that that's helpful. So hopefully, folks have a little bit of a sense of MacArthur. We're here in Chicago, uh, but we are actually an international foundation. Um, we are uh, quite a large foundation, actually. We give out about $280 million a year for folks that don't know, because we tend to be primarily known for our funding of NPR, because folks often hear the supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur uh, Foundation on NPR as they're going to work, and also hear the news about the Genius Awards that we give out every September. But we actually fund internationally uh, with five offices around the world, as well as nationally in the United States. Uh, and we uh, have been funding uh, since our inception in 1980 in the area of public education. Uh, and up until 2005, uh, that funding has been, uh, in many respects, what most people would recognize as school reform funding, uh, funding in standards, funding in district reform, funding in teacher professional development. But uh, Mimi, as you know well, in 2005, we decided to take a step back and really try to understand uh, really trying, we thought we were taking a lens uh, really about looking towards the future to understand what schools might need to be in the future uh, with a, primarily with a lens on trying to understand uh, how kids were learning with digital media. And we turned to, to Mimi and a whole crew of uh, anthropologists and ethnographers to help us get a sense of what young people were doing with digital media outside of school to give us a sense of what that might look like. Uh, and Mimi gave a great uh, webinar. Uh, uh, Mimi gave talking. a great webinar. Uh, oh, I'm hearing an echo. Uh, uh, oh, I'm hearing an echo. Uh, okay, to keep going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to to talk about that. Um, and for us, what was what has been really important in launching this initiative has been uh, because, and I should say that I am a long-time educator, so I, in addition to having a background in education and in child development, I have also been an associate professor, professor in a school of education uh, where I spent uh, many years training teachers in both elementary and secondary education. And so what I've been learning from the folks involved in, digital, in the digital media and learning initiative has really been a major shift and helping to reimagine what learning can be in the 21st century uh, and creating new paradigms for beginning to think about that. And for us, that started uh, with three core sort of presumptions uh, that we learned from folks like Mimi and others about how we wanted to begin our exploration uh, that would begin to help us reframe and reimagine what learning can look like. Uh, and the first sort of shift for us was really that we started to shift away from thinking about the core outcomes about what we wanted kids to uh, know uh, the, in the languages of education, a shift away from focusing on hardcore outcomes about what kids should know and be able to do, and much more a focus on really establishing what are some core questions that we need to explore as a community to give us some freedom to step outside of the, the box that is traditional education. The second thing that really shaped our grant making and the way we approached this it was a shift from talking about education to a shift to talking about learning, uh, which is, was simply because when folks talk about education, they tend to speak uh, primarily of what happens within a school building. And we all know uh, in, uh, just from our own experience, but also uh, from spending time with kids, that learning happens everywhere. And we wanted to, and at any time, and we wanted to be able to take advantage of that. And the third, of course, was that we really wanted to understand and explore learning uh, uh, from the kids' perspective, from the user's perspective, as designers would say, and much less from an institutional outcomes perspective. And those three big shifts uh, in 2005 from the very beginning of our grant making uh, uh, opened up a whole new way of doing grant making, a whole new way of thinking about uh, what, our, what our goals were, and a whole new way of beginning to approach what learning might be. Um, so fast forward, uh, let me do the math, fast forward seven years, uh, we're $100 million into the initiative. 
Uh, we have been funding research. We've been funding uh, the design of new learning environments uh, and also the funding of uh, the reimagining of institutions where kids, uh, where many of our resources lie for learning. Um, and so uh, in the last two years, uh, it, 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 as has been discussed on this webinar, in this webinar series, we really tried to bring together um, many of the folks who've been involved in the Digital Media and Learning Initiative to say, is there a broader paradigmatic frame that we can be talking about that brings much of what we've learned over the last five years together under one umbrella? Um, and that's what, what folks here uh, and on the webinar series have been talking about is connected learning. Um, and just uh, for the purposes of, of reminding folks, uh, this is a, a slide that I often use uh, when I talk about it. I'll get to the next slide. Um, but just very simply, when, uh, uh, when I talk about it with my board and with others, I try to make it as simple as possible and, and to say from the outset that when we're talking about connected learning, we're really talking about what we've learned from the research and what we all know that learning is most robust and most resilient when we can bring together the three um, areas of a kid's life that is most important to them, uh, their peer group, the area of their life that they most want to get better at or their area of interest, um, and an academic career or civic uh, orientation or uh, possibility or that sphere of their life. And we think that in doing that, in bringing these three core areas together, that we can create multiple points of entry for more kids um, to learning and that we can also begin to create more pathways toward career, civic, and academic success. Um, so very briefly, in a nutshell, that's how um, we've begun to frame connected learning. Uh, and in simple ways use this as a, as a little bit of a graphic to say it's a very, very simple idea, uh, incredibly difficult to implement, but yet a very simple idea. Uh, in uh, many respects, use this slide as a very simple way to depict it, but it really, that slide, I don't want to confuse anybody, that slide is meant to be just a simple representation of what many have already seen, especially on the site of, of this other slide that really goes much more deeply into what is meant by connected learning and what the design principles for connected learning are. Um, and Mimi has talked about these, Brother Mike has talked about these on another webinar, as has Katie Salen. Um, and I think one of the things that might be interesting to talk about today or with the folks uh, who are listening in is also to, uh, uh, let me just talk about this slide too before I get to the next slide. Uh, and to be really clear too that when we're talking about connected learning, we are talking about an approach to learning that we think both grapples with some of uh, what uh, have always been the core skills and capacities that we have always cared about when we talk about learning and education, but we also think that it is a means to getting at some of the 20, what uh, we have begun to call the 21st century skills that we all care about. Um, so that's an important thing to make clear. Um, last, uh, one of the last things, just in terms of general overview, and this is what I was referring to as might be an interesting thing for us to talk about too, is the ways in which uh, as we define and talk about and think about what the reimagining of learning means, uh, that what's currently happening in the uh, education technology space that gets so much of press coverage today, whether it's online courses, whether it's Khan Academy or Cognitive Tutor, um, many of those things which are terrific in their own right and have a very specific purpose. Um, that's, not exact, that's not what we're talking about. Um, and it's really important to differentiate between the work that needs to be done to reimagine learning uh, and to make the most of the kinds of new tools that are out there and some of the what I would define as kind of a web 1.0 effort to use current technologies to make traditional approaches to schooling a little bit more efficient. And so uh, I'd be happy to, to dig in on a conversation about uh, what those differences are so that, so that as a community we can be clear about that. Um, and so now I have some uh, very rudimentary slides that I just wanted to put up there because I thought that it may or may not be helpful in terms of providing an overview uh, for some of the previous conversations that have uh, been happening here on uh, connectedlearning.tv because I think there's just been an extraordinary lineup. The, the 22 episodes that have gone so far and the ones uh, that are coming, uh, I think it might be helpful for the audience just to know that uh, in a connected learning approach, all of the topics that have been covered 
are all crucial uh, and are connected, uh, not to overuse a word, in an, a very important sort of broader frame for how we think about the kind of work that needs to happen um, in order to move this vision of connected learning forward. Um, and so in order to do that, I just wanted to take us one step back, which is to say, uh, when our founding fathers created our, our educational system, uh, they established and were very clear about what its goals were. And in many respects, uh, more than 200 years later, it, it, one could argue that they got it right, that those goals for our broader educational system or for learning in general still exist today, which is um, for young people, a preparation and engagement in uh, understanding lifelong learning, preparation and engagement uh, to be citizens in a democracy, and for economic self-sufficiency. Um, and so when we talk about learning and we talk about connected learning, I think we're still holding those goals. Uh, but one could also argue that in the 21st century, what it looks like to be a lifelong learner, what it looks like to participate in democracy, what it looks like to become economically self-sufficient has changed dramatically. And so part of what uh, the work is of connected learning and what we would also say is a, a piece of the digital media and learning initiative is to really understand both conceptually and from a paradigmatic frame, uh, what does it mean to be a lifelong learner in the 21st century? What does it mean to be a democratic citizen? And what does it mean to participate um, in a worldwide global economy uh, in a time of, uh, that is a time of both transition and dramatic change? And so uh, for us, that casts these goals in a completely different context and a completely different frame um, than what they were cast in more than 200 years ago. And so that's in many respects, and how you do that uh, within a value set that places equity at the forefront um, is part of our mission and our challenge. And so I just wanted to, I sort of took it upon myself this morning just to go through the list of folks who had spoken already in, in uh, um, uh, webinars, just to say a little bit, every, uh, each person I think uh, speaks to all three of these goals. But if I were to categorize them, which is so often what a funder ends up doing, uh, I would say that in many respects, as we lay out the landscape or the ecosystem of uh, what folks are working on and, and where they're pushing, um, often when I think about uh, Mimi's work and Katie's work and what Brother Mike is doing and, and Craig and Mitch, is I really think they're redefining and reimagining the notion of learning and what that looks like. Um, many of you hopefully have heard heard Joe and Kathy and Ethan and Andrew. Um, and in many respects, when we think about the role of the web um, in, in our culture, it really is about redefining democracy and what young people need to understand uh, in order to participate in this democracy is coming so much out of that work. Um, and I think everybody, all of this speaks to what it means to participate in a global economy in a time of, of constant change. In specific, I do think that uh, whether it's the badges work or the work on digital literacy and some of the maker hacker work speaks very specifically to some of the notions of this changing global economy. Um, and then lastly, I think some of the work, uh, core to this work and core to the work that uh, Connected Learning is helping to define and that MacArthur is very involved in funding is that as part of this ecosystem, we have to have a much broader and a, and, and a learning infrastructure that looks dramatically different from the one we currently have. So the learning infrastructure and ecosystem that we have today is very much fo focused on an isolated school as the place where education slash learning is delivered. And instead, we need to understand what the broader infrastructure uh, and what the broader learning ecosystem needs to look like and will look like in the 21st century. Um, what are the policies? The privacy issue has to be unpacked and really understood within this context. The role of the teacher and the adult, the role of social media, what the online space in P2PU, and certainly the role of badges is a piece of that. Um, and so I think what I'm hoping we can talk about today, and, I, and there's no question that the role of our institutions, particularly our libraries and our museums, we think are fundamental to building this larger learning ecosystem. Um, and so I, I want to end there in terms of uh, both understanding and perhaps having a broader conversation with the folks on the chat with us about how do we build this learning ecosystem that gets at uh, helping young people to have a connected learning experience 
uh, both we can talk about what is the role of philanthropy, what is the role of our institutions, and how we can partner and begin to build this ecosystem together. So Mimi, I'm going to stop there. Great. Thanks so much, Connie. That was a fantastic sort of history and overview of um, so much of the DML and connected learning work. Um, and we've been joined by uh, Mike Hawkins. Brother Mike, uh, I wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Brother Mike Hawkins from uh, UMedia Chicago, uh, working with Digital Youth Network. And been part of this, uh, what I like to call the collect connected learning movement, uh, you know, for quite a while now. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to jump into this conversation and you know, talk about some of the current work we're doing um, based on you know this connected learning model. Great, thanks, Mike. And Marsha, uh, I did introduce you, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to say hello too. Now that you're connected. Oh, are we? I'm not hearing. Marsha, are you muted by any chance? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we may have to troubleshoot Marsha's audio. Um, so while we're waiting for that, why don't, um, I think uh, Connie has sort of start us off with a really um, great question about how we build a learning ecosystem given, you know, the very diverse range of um, both learning goals and organizations and infrastructures that we've been talking about as part of our connected learning model. I think what's been extraordinary about Connie's work at MacArthur is the fact that she's been able to mobilize such a diverse network of partners and grantees um, and also other funders uh, and mo to mobilize behind this vision of learning, this reimagined vision of learning, um, which is what makes it tremendously exciting but also tremendously challenging because we're not relying on our existing organizational models to dictate how we do our work. Um, so I think in the Hangout today we have a really good uh, range of voices of uh, folks in different kinds of institutional locations looking at different models of learning and change. So I wanted in, to invite um, Doug or Marsha if, um, if you're on uh, and Brother Mike to uh, jump in on sort of this question of how do we build this learning ecosystem together. Yeah, I've got a, um, just a quick kind of clarificatory question for um, Connie. Um, I don't know how easy it would be to answer, but it seems to me that, you know, you talked about the MacArthur Foundation being a worldwide foundation, certainly funding some fantastic stuff all over the world, including some of the Open Badges stuff. Um, there's some groups doing some fantastic work over here in the UK. Um, but a lot of the stuff seems to be quite US centric for, for obvious okay. reasons. And I wondered to, to what extent the purpose of education, um, as far as you see it, differs country to country or context to context or, or whether you think there's, a, there's one kind of purpose to education which kind of rules everything. So uh, I'm happy to have others join in on that conversation, uh, and I think it's a great question. So I would, I have to, I have to say um, that from both my travels and scholarship slash research, uh, I've been an advisor to the Singaporean Ministry of Education. I've taught in Africa, um, traveled through Europe, etc. Whether it's from the historic British colonization. Uh, and a variety of other historic factors, I wish that I saw greater variety uh, in purposes of education and the way that education is delivered around the world. Um, Mimi, you also, and Doug, you, I mean, you both have international perspectives. I'm not sure that I see tremendous variation uh, around the world in terms of purposes of education. Uh, I, uh, the, the, what uh, added later in um, our country, uh, which I think is true internationally, is the purpose of assimilation uh, as a goal for education. So there's the, the, the social assimilation issue. 
that got raised and has become a part of the purpose of our broader educational system. It wasn't necessarily one of the first, uh, as our founding fathers saw it, as the core goal or purpose of education, but I would say that that uh, has become a core goal of education too. So that's kind of a fourth goal that gets layered in there. And I, I again, I may be, I'm happy to be totally wrong um, in my perspective. I'm not an international scholar, but I would say uh, that I don't see tons of variation or internationally around the purposes of education. Cool, thank you. Cheers. And I'm, Doug, or, Doug or Mimi, I'm curious if, if you guys do. Uh, well, no, I mean, I, I've got a lot less experience in such than you have, um, Connie. I just, um, I, I see kind of a, this is kind of the, the macro elements of the purpose of education, um, which is, I think, certainly what the connected learning stuff feeds into. You know, these are mm -hmm. for everybody, but then there's kind of little, little micro things which depend heavily upon context. But I think you're absolutely right in terms of the broader purposes of education and, and when we when it's education is writ large. I, 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 one concern that I do have is that I think uh, in over time the goal of lifelong learning, of making sure that everybody has the skills to become a lifelong learner, uh, and I do worry about the um, uh, citizenship. I, I think that uh, internationally and in the United States certainly the goal for economic self-sufficiency has become the prominent goal for education, and so I think how we prioritize the goals has, has shifted and changed. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Connie, that I think, you know, if you, there is sort of a lot of very broad commonalities in the range of things that people think of as the purpose of educational systems, but the emphasis on them varies tremendously, I think, um, <clears throat> between uh, even individual schools, but also national contexts that are focused on more of the competitive economic kinds of outputs versus the more uh, civic and uh, you know participatory kinds of dimensions or um, you know systems that are more um, you know or less focused on the uh, baseline participation versus that kind of individual excellence and competitiveness. I do see a lot of variation internationally, um, even though the range of uh, goals does seem very similar in a lot of ways. Um, I don't know, Brother Mike, did you want to? Well, I think in terms of like, you know, building that, that kind of ecosystem, um, you know, I think the the question of purpose is a is the key question, and I think I hear that a lot from you know the teens on the ground, uh, where often they question you know for them like why are they even doing some of the stuff they're doing in school, uh, like they can't attach like what it means to do this task and say you know math or English to a real tangible. Uh, career opportunity or in some case even just an interest is like even if they were interested in writing uh, they don't have an accurate place to showcase it is like you know here's my paper <laughs> and then we're done so I think giving kids you know these kind of informal opportunities to you know learn outside of the school and I think you know what we've done in some semblance in America is you know, really box learning into these, you know, siloed spaces. But I think, you know, with examples like you media, uh, where we're kind of couched in a library, uh, the community has a whole new learning space. And based on the kind of, you know, creativity and connection that's coming from that space, you know, we're able to identify, you know, a bunch of partners uh, who who could provide opportunities that kids you know really care about, but also it engages them you know to learn in a different way. Uh, you know, we just recently started the High Fashion Project, uh, and what's interesting about that is it not only connects you know about twenty institutions in Chicago, but it also connects twenty institutions across uh, New York you know, to develop programming uh, that can on-ramp kids to, you know, really learn in a new way, but also see this kind of economic self-sufficiency we're talking about 
where these skills that they're picking up either as you know designers uh, or documentarians you know they can take with them in other places these things uh, you know the critical thinking skills that they're going to pick up you know these are things that are going to transfer into their school life and hopefully their community and civic life um, and that's just one example I mean you know we're also uh, at U Media currently um, working with the Born This Way Foundation and you know we got our kids kind of working on you know a bunch of kind of civic minded you know activities they can do uh, you know and that's fostered by interest in you know partly Lady Gaga but also like you know their place in the world is creators and people who have a voice and who want to see equality not not only in their social settings but in their educational settings and uh, you know U Media has been able to be a you know kind of connected learning hub for that that sense and I think it's a good model for you know where we want to take education because uh, if they're learning you know in these spaces you know not only fueled by pop culture uh, but also you know taking books like Toni Morrison's A Mercy and reading that informally after school uh, you know their teachers don't even know about that sometimes and it's like if we can really make the connection between you know these learning experiences that are happening uh, in critically engaging ways uh, back to our schools I think you know we've got a good good chance to make some you know, really effective change in uh, expanding this learning ecology yep Thanks, Brother Mike, for, um, I think you've touched on a lot of the really unique kind of networks of partners that are being enlisted into this work. Um, Connie, I wonder, um, you know, Brother Mike mentioned the Hive networks and learning institutions, mm -hmm. links to schools, also um, our, some of our private sector partners um, uh, and the pop, popular culture domain um, and the Born This Way Foundation. Um, Connie, I was wondering if maybe you could give a bit of an overview about your strategy around um, the uh, developing the Hive networks and partnerships in the private sector, you know, and really some of the challenges and lessons learned in building these public-private partnerships or these partnerships across uh, different regional institutions that are really designed to start tackling this question of, uh, you know, building regional learning ecologies that support a different form of learning. Sure, I can give that a shot, um, and hopefully Marsha will be able to, to join us. Um, so one of the things, so the hives started uh, from... So you can hear it. Uh, okay. Marsha, can you, yeah, there she moved it. Um, so the, the hives start, so we have a hive learning network in New York and a hive learning network in Chicago. Uh, and we hope to have uh, high learning networks in a few other cities. Uh, certainly by early 2013, we'll be able to announce. And the background on that is one of the things, Mimi, that we learned um, from your study as well as some from, from some of the other work that we funded. Uh, and this clearly isn't something that a young person would say, but it's a, a condensed way of saying what we learned from the kids is that Schools, in many respects, are just a node on their broader network of learning, and that their learning, uh, if we take this learning anytime, anywhere uh, perspective really seriously, and if we also understand the culture of the web and what we've learned from interest-driven communities, it's that learning uh, in the 21st century is going to happen across networks. And so we have to take that network metaphor seriously for institutions on the ground, too, if we're going to really merge, which is so much of what connected learning is about, merge the extraordinary resources of what's happening on the web and what young people are doing on the web with what we know uh, are the extraordinary resources and possibilities of what's in our institutions. And so what we wanted to begin to do is to think about instead of having all of our wonderful institutions on the ground in our cities work in silos and work separately and often compete with each other. We, we hear you, Marsha. I think. Oh, you working? can hear me now? Yeah, we can hear Yay. you. Welcome. I was feeling disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was feeling like a disconnected teen who saw these wonderful people and opportunities and didn't have the path to join you. Well, I'm so happy you can join us. Yes, we've been trying here. That's terrific. So I'm going to quickly answer this question, and then hopefully it will lead right over to you. Okay. I'm just talking about the Hive Learning Networks. Mm -hmm. Um, so the idea in, uh, at its simplest is can we both through digital media, through seeding innovative grants on the ground um, and bringing folks together begin to help uh, create, uh, bring the institutions on the ground with the online world in a way that they become connected in a networked fashion. So that a uh, young person, it's, uh, for me, it's a twofold uh, uh, experience. One is the experience of the learner. We very much in the Hive Learning Networks want a young person to be able to move seamlessly from institution to institution and be able to both track their progress and continue to be challenged regardless of what institution they're in, but also to be able to follow up on if I'm interested in science or if I'm interested in fashion, I might be doing something at the UMedia in, in the Chicago Public Library, but I could also go to the Museum of Science and Industry and continue with that, and the Museum of Science and Industry will know that that's what I'm interested in, and I can follow that so that I'm having a connected experience, um, and similarly be connected with schools. Uh, but, the, but the second part of that is that we want the institutions to be part of an innovation community. So that uh, in addition to the, and forgive me for the, to the Android folks in the, in the community, uh, but I'll use an iPhone metaphor. Uh, if, if an ecosystem or an ecology is working well, if the learner, a, on the one hand we want the, the learner and the user experience to get better and better and better, and at the same time, we want the ecosystem to get smarter and smarter and smarter. So we also want the adults and the institutions within that network to constantly be connected, to be learning from each other, and to be getting smarter and smarter. Um, so that's the goal of the learning networks, and we think that that should happen across the city, that a city should be a learning platform and a learning innovation space for the institutions, the adults, and the kids that exist. Because you have to, in some ways, be in close proximity to each other. Uh, we've learned that from all the innovation work, and we've learned that from Richard Florida and all of the ways in which innovation happens. The last thing I'll say in part as a res two things that I'll say, one in response to your question, Mimi, and then one to turn it over to Marsha. Um, on the technology innovation side, there's no question that private industry is further ahead than is the public sector. And so we very much want to figure, and there's no reason we think for the public sector to duplicate what's happening in private industry. So what are the hybrid kinds of partnerships that bring those two together that allow the public sector to take advantage of what's being learned in the private sector to advance learning um, while also allowing uh, some of the opportunities that are happening in the private space to be connected to kids' experience because we know that's where kids are doing an extraordinary amount of learning. So we're now in this very difficult um, but exciting and challenging space of figuring out those public-private hybrids, which I think um, Mozilla in many respects is just the perfect partner because they've learned so much about how to do public-private partnerships and how to build community. Uh, so I really have welcomed and they've been an extraordinary partner in this space, um, as has IMLS. Uh, has been an extraordinary public partner in this space, and we really think of libraries and museums uh, as catalysts for helping us to build these learning networks. Uh, and that's a huge uh, reason for uh, uh, our leading partner uh, in many, respe many respects in this work, which is the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Thank you, Connie. Can you hear me? I can. Can everybody else? Yep, we can hear okay, you. Okay, good. <laughs> good. I'm sorry that it's taken me a while to get hooked up here. But um, 
I, I've just, uh, we of course resonate with so much of what's been said uh, during this hour and of course our institutions, we have over 100,000 libraries and 18,000 museums of all kinds in the United States and IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, is a small independent federal agency that helps to build the capacity of these libraries and museums to perform exactly the same sort of uh, traditional and uh, current uh, education functions that Connie talked about at the beginning of this uh, hour. In other words, they have always been institutions of lifelong learning. They have always been institutions promoting democracy and strong community anchor organizations. And they've always been institutions that have helped build the important competencies of our publics in this country, including economic self-sufficiency. And we did a project a couple of years ago that was uh, around libraries and museums and 21st century skills that really was developing just as Connie and the leadership at MacArthur were really uh, funding the early adopters of the uh, learning labs, the media center at the Chicago Public Library. The launch of that actually corresponded with the launch of our report on libraries and museums and 21st century skills. So it's been very, very exciting to co-invest uh, with uh, MacArthur in order to build out and test other models of libraries and museums working together in their own communities to, tr to test out, explore, and further develop the set of design principles and research findings that Mimi and her research network have been working on. We have funded uh, really edge, edge, edgy projects in libraries and museums and learning for a long time. But this gives us a chance to join in this burgeoning network and to get these sites in these communities to think together and join a larger cohort of experimental and innovation sites where they can start uh, developing programs, uh, developing staff competencies, and learning together about what is working and what isn't working in these spaces. And that's not only, I mean, this is largely, of course, to serve the, the publics and the needs of our learners, especially our young learners who have different needs and are in a different society today. But it's also because our institutions have to adapt. They have to think about where and how they are uh, changing to, uh, to think about how are their collections changing? How are their spaces changing? How can they be more relevant to users? And how, above all, can they be more accessible? Um, not too many libraries and museums have thought about themselves as places of for hanging out, for example. Uh, and our work with Mimi and with the MacArthur Foundation uh, is saying, you know, we have to think about new ways of configuring our spaces. We have to think about new ways of performing. We have to think about new linkages and connections between peer groups and between the kinds of mentors, facilitators, and what we would call sort of knowledge experts in our libraries and museums. And how do they have to change and adopt and adapt and really leverage what they know because I think young people are really interested in what they know but there are new ways that they need to connect and communicate with this uh, new generation of learners. Why don't I stop there? I'm, I'm mindful of time Mimi so um, maybe I can turn it over to you now. Sure. It looks like we might have lost Connie. Um, hopefully she'll be back on. I, I was having a, f a few bandwidth issues as well. Um, but uh, why don't I, um, there's a question from the live stream that I, I thought was interesting and um, maybe some folks would like to respond to, which is, um, you know, I think we've had, uh, Marsha, your overview was really, really helpful in thinking of some of the challenges for institutions and in rethinking um, the learning models and the role they play within the learning ecology. Um, the question, if I'm understanding it correctly, is really about the learner side expectations. So what happens, um, how do learners respond to um, this reimagined vision of learning? Um, 
is it fair to sort of change the expectations and their um, apply a new system to them when they're um, you know they've been socialized into certain kinds of expectations um, I don't know brother Mike maybe you have a view on that based on the kids who you've seen going through your programs and you know they've been navigating a lot of different kinds of learning expectations and ecosystems I think uh, I mean they're used to a, a certain you know set of expectations from school I think uh, and in some ways we we mimic that like you know we have our you know end of the project deadlines and stuff like that but I think the motivation for them to do it uh, to stick to those deadlines uh, is really you know connected to their interest I mean uh, you know, you can have a kid that just puts out one product and they're done. Uh, but I think this new type of ecology where, you know, the, the works are a lot more public. Uh, you know, and for us, it's in our social network where kids can, you know, kind of connect to each other and, you know, as projects are going on to kind of see, like, you know, where they are with work. They can see open critique. Uh, both from their peers and their mentors. And uh, fostered with their mentors or experts in the space. Uh, and they also, you know, and I think that drives them to you know, want to meet those deadlines and get better at stuff. But, you know, at the same time, like I deal with teenagers, so let's just keep the reality of it. You got to stay on them too. So it's the, and again, I think that's fostered by the relationships of the people in the space. Uh, you know, you media is a great space with, you know, computers and uh, it's just a, a wonderful setting. But I think the fact that we have empowered staff allows us to empower students, you know, to uh, to reach their goals or open the doors to things that they wouldn't even know about. Uh, and they actually push us too, <laughs> as mentors and staff in the space. Because uh, I think part of this piece uh, that, I, that I've seen so prevalent is that students say that, uh, you know, I can also teach in the space too. I can teach my peers, but I can also teach my mentors. And that's such a difference, uh, I think, in approach than how they see traditional school settings uh, where they're just being taught to. And I think this, this new space, this new ecology, this new way of thinking about approaching uh, education in this kind of community model, uh, you know, is really, I think empowered students in a whole new way. And, you know, it's also opened the doors to, you know, various institutions, museums, libraries, uh, for them to think about, uh, you know, how they can engage students different, but also how the staff can bring, you know, their, uh, their wealth of knowledge to the table. And, um, yeah, so I think that that's such a different kind of, set where you see learning going on all around you and to boot it's cool <laughs> you know uh, so I think uh, yeah it's just been a, a great experience kind of watching it unfold uh, over the last you know three or four years in the, in the library space yeah so I, I totally agree with that I mean basically what you've got is um, young people and, and adults bringing very different things to the, to the table um, and often that gets, you know, the, the power relations question is a really interesting one because to my mind, and one of the reasons why I wanted to get so involved with the, the um, MacArthur funded Mozilla stuff around Open Badges is because I see assessment as really crucial to, to changing learning because if you change learning, pretty much everything has to change um, in response to it. So I used to be a teacher, uh, and I've seen the kind of different types of classrooms there are. I've seen the kind of informal stuff, the really, really formal, um, top-down, you will be quiet, here the exam, the exam kind of um, classrooms. And it seems to me that those kind of classrooms are really missing something in the sense that you just talked about, Brother Mike, in, in the sense that 
that they're missing the richness of experience, the, the stuff that young people can bring to the table, which isn't, it's sometimes knowledge, but sometimes it's, it's things like enthusiasm, different ways of looking at questions, just different ways of looking at the world, or, or, or more relevant ways of looking at the world. So um, I, I think that assessment piece is really, really important, and so I'm really glad that MacArthur's doing all this work around that. Um, I have a question from the live stream, which I think um, speaks to some of what's um, Brother Mike and Doug have uh, been raising, which is, uh, is it possible for connected learning to take place without fundamental transformations and power relations between youth and adults? I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. <laughs> well, Marcia, were you going to go? Oh, Marsh, I think you may be muted, or we're not hearing you. All right. Oh, How's there you that? Go. Okay. Yep. We're good. Uh, you know, I think even though museums and libraries are not classrooms, I think uh, they, they, the people in our those institutions are rethinking what their roles are vis-a-vis -vis their audiences in very much the same way that Doug just suggested and Brother Mike alluded to. Uh, and what it means is that you know you're much more of a facilitator. You you use your knowledge, but you're not presenting that knowledge. You're not filling an empty vessel uh, with uh, wisdom but you are facilitating and this is gets right to the heart of these 21st century skills you're facilitating uh, critical analysis you're facilitating uh, ownership of solving particular problems uh, you're facilitating uh, the curiosity and wonder and passions that are already there in so many of our youth and and it that said, you are empowering them. I don't think you're losing any of your power. I think it's just shifting your role in a very exciting way. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, but that the, these, um, what I find interesting about these conversations about connected learning is that these discussions about power and authority really do come to the forefront in a lot of ways. Um, so it helps us question those. Um, so we're we're nearing, or we are at the top of our hour. Um, I wanted to, um, before we end the session, just give um, all of you on our hangout a, a chance for any last. Um, comment that you wanted to close with um, <laughs> or not <laughs> but. Yeah, I just want to say thank you guys for the, the invite uh, and you know just currently you know you media uh, in Chicago we've been really thinking about uh, the hardcore application of connected learning I think for us uh, <laughs> You know, looking at the Hamago model, uh, the hanging out, messing around, and geeking out, is you know really allowed us to kind of you know look at this connected learning model and realize like the schools are so important to us to you know really you know aim back to. I think you know we have done a, a good job in terms of really having our foot you know our ear to the ground in terms of the peer culture and the interest piece. But I think, you know, what we really want to do this year is kind of think about how to really open that up to the community in terms of, uh, you know, the academic piece, the economic piece. And I think we have some you know, good projects on the table to help facilitate that. And, uh, yeah, so the, I'm just really excited to see, like, how the connected learning pieces come together for us. And uh, I think it's going to be a good narrative. And and Mimi, if I may, I think that what we have seen with our learning labs competition and uh, just tremendous interest from our communities of libraries and museums about because they they know that uh, they've got incredible resources to offer and they're really interested in uh, being as engaged and effective members of the uh, learning ecosystems in their communities as possible. So everybody knows collaboration is hard. Everybody knows change can be threatening, but we have seen just a surge of interest in this work and we are thrilled to be able to facilitate it. 
Yeah, and I just want to say, if anyone hasn't seen Open Badges, then they might want to go to openbadges.org. Um, <laughs> nice little plug in there. Because I really do think the assessment piece is important, um, and it, it's key to kind of reimagining um, what we can do both in, inside and outside of um, formal education. So Great. thank you, Mimi, for, for moderating. Yeah, thank you yes, all for really you. a fantastic discussion for joining us today. Um, Connie sends her... Uh, Thanks and farewells over email. Um, she wasn't able to get on, back on, but um, I really enjoyed the discussion and appreciate your taking the time. Uh, this uh, session will be archived on connectedlearning.tv later today, so if you missed any part of it, you'll have access to the chat transcript and the archive of the session. Uh, our next session will be um, uh, next Tuesday on the 14th at 10 a.m. Pacific with Elise eidman Idal um, discussing communities of practice um, and how to frame connected learning in the workplace uh, and beyond. Uh, we also um, want to encourage folks to um, look at the connected learning group on Digo if you're a user of that bookmarking site. Uh, we're really um, starting a process of curating more of our resources and things that have been emerging from uh, the webinars as well as the broader community. Um, so if you can help us uh, start building that uh, base of resources, we'd really, really appreciate it. So again, thanks to all our participants and um, hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.